<laughs> okay, I think we should start. And um, the um, <clears throat> the lecture today <clears throat> is on the the 1993 flood in the Middle West. So that's eight years ago, so you may remember it, you may not, but um, <clears throat> it was a major event in the country, national event, and it brought forth the report, the first part of which you are going to read or reading for your home for your reading assignment for next week. <clears throat> and uh, what I want to do today is first of all to discuss the report briefly and you I'll just show it to you the uh, you got the first part which is about 10 percent of that and then there are two other volumes here and I don't know how many reports since then but it was a very major effort this was done under the direction of General Galloway the Corps of General of the Corps of Engineers and Dean of the uh, school at West Point uh, who was an environmental engineer who actually was one of our graduate students many years ago. Uh, <clears throat> and um, I want to summarize the whole report for you briefly. You're reading an introduction to it anyway, which is a very good introduction. Uh, but the idea, which was fairly obvious, was to describe, first of all, what happened. Why did this massive flood occur even uh, and um, it occurred right in an area or very close to an area which we had looked at the, Miz the Missouri River Basin and so why did this occur that was, uh, that was the first major uh, question facing the Galloway and his committee and uh, they defined it in terms of uh, a um, a, a flood that was the worst that had ever happened in history, the worst recorded flood uh, in this region uh, that had ever been recorded before. So you think about back to Professor Smith's lecture, which I didn't attend, but fortunately we have videotapes, so I, I saw the lecture. And uh, probable maximum precipitation. I think that the result in 1993 was by then an improbable maximum precipitation and it led to an improbable maximum flood that certainly was not predicted. So that's the first issue, that it was a non-predicted flood. Uh, the second aspect of it was that it was particularly damaging because of the land use in the region uh, the, where the rainfall occurred. And the report makes it quite clear that that essentially occurred before 1930. In other words, the, uh, r the th one thrust of the report is that the land use, let's say, in the almost totally unregulated, ungoverned uh, use of the land in the country uh, before the 308 reports, before the, uh, the, the big dams, before the Pixlone report, before any of that structuring took place. There were no dams on the main stem of the Missouri, uh, there were a few dams in the area, but not very much. So there, the second point, it was not only a record flood, but it was one that was due in part anyway. The damage, the flood itself, of course, that was unrecorded, but the effect it had naturally depended to, to a great extent on the runoff, as you know, and that depended upon the land use, which had changed rapidly. It was a forested area in the 19th century, all of it, heavily forested, and it was deforested. And uh, so there was a major change in the way it was used. And then, of course, human settlement grew up there rapidly in the early 20th century. So that's the second feature of describing what happened. And the third feature was to try to put some cost on it. And so what uh, the Galloway does is to state that the cost of the flood, that is the, the, the damage, in dollars was somewhere between 12 and 16 billion dollars. That's 1993 dollars. And uh, that's a very large amount of money, of course. And um, 
So then he wanted to compare that to what, oh, and also then another six billion dollars to clean it up. So it's not just the damage, uh, but then the recovery in effect. Cost of recovery, you have to replace a lot of things, uh, a lot of people have insurance, and a lot of people don't have insurance, and so forth. And so you have the, the costs. But then he goes on to talk about what might be called the uh, after the effect benefits. In other words, the structuring, particularly the dams and levees, and some of the practices that had been put in place dealing with land use after the 1930s, really after the, after the 1970s, um, that that saved a certain amount of money. And he puts an estimate on that as $19 billion. So in, in short, what he's, what he's claiming, what, it's a big committee writing this really, he's just in charge of it, is claiming that, uh, that the actual cost would have been, instead of 16 plus 6, 22 billion, it would have been another 19 billion. So something of the order of 40, 41 billion dollars. Uh, so the claim is that what had been done anyway had substantial value. Now these costs are always very difficult to, to uh, pin down for sure, but this is the report nevertheless that went to the, essentially to the president uh, at the time, President Clinton. Now, then comes the remarkable statement that it'll happen again. This will happen again. Now of course there's, there's no way of predicting that. I think you realize that by now that this, this predictability is a very difficult one. You recall Professor Smith ended his lecture yet last time by showing you that the rainfall in his hypothetical example would have been, what was it, 715 millimeters or something? Somebody remember that number? Whatever it was, uh, that if you assume the wind speed bringing the moisture into the block that you were talking about, if you assume that was double, well then you just have double the rainfall. Well that's a huge difference and the assumption of wind is a very difficult one to make. Uh, when we look at structures, for example, we have a whole series, a category of structures that have failed in the wind because people are unable to predict how the wind actually behaves. So, <clears throat> the question is, since it will occur, I mean, that's the claim, or at least it is reasonable to expect it to occur, what are you going to do about it? Millions of people living out there, uh, billions and billions of dollars of investment in that area, what is to be done? And the reason that it's worthwhile looking at this kind of a report at this stage in the course is because we have gone through by now a series of river basins. And the, we, we know that these, that these have to be looked at in terms of the basin, not just the individual dam or the individual city or something. Uh, and we know that this is complicated politically, very complicated. It's complicated enough technologically, but it's also complicated politically. And so, what does this propose? And um, uh, of course, uh, they, they make these kinds of uh, proposals. They make three types of proposals. The first one is a purely technological, scientific one, that there should be better ways of collecting data. And you've seen examples of this because Professor Smith is intimately involved in doing this. He is out right now somewhere in uh, one of those great rainforest areas of, of Arizona uh, looking at I don't know what, but he's always out doing this kind of thing, as a, not just, but partly as a result of this flood, because of the fact that there now are these wonderful methods of, uh, of making these surveys, of collecting data, of interpreting it, and, uh, and therefore having a better way of trying to predict uh, what's going to happen. So the scientific technological side is, is uh, mentioned in the report, uh, and what that means, of course, is what the, the end result of a report like this will be a recommendation to the Congress and to the President. Really, it's a recommendation to the President, but it also goes to the Congress. Namely, that there should be money spent for certain things. That's the upshot of something like this. And so one aspect is for more research and development in the light of collecting data and, and so forth. The second issue is the political one. And this is the one that we have already seen a lot of, that namely that you need to plan a river basin. And that immediately puts you in 
political conflict with, between the federal government and the states, and even more local than that, uh, the cities or the little or the regions. And uh, as you know, our political system is such that uh, this automatically leads to all kinds of complications, political complications. So the effort, which usually ends up, these reports usually end up this way, is first of all to have some better organization. And uh, <clears throat> if you read it, the, the whole report, they, they have a glossary in the back which has these horrible, ac excuse me, horrible acronyms, you know, the GHS talking to the QEG, and this, this, and then you look and find out what agency that means. You know, so you realize that there must be literally 50 agencies involved, 50 constituted governmental agencies involved in something like this. Uh, I could even hold it up if I can find it quickly enough. It's a, it's a lesson in, well, I'm, I don't think I can find it right away, but anyway, it just, it's just a way of showing you uh, indicating the complexity of government. And uh, so they want to streamline that. Well, that's, a <clears throat> uh, that's a, an important issue of organization and the purpose of it is planning. So that the idea of, of this kind of, of getting a better organization is so you can plan and planning of course means for some kind of action that will be in effect uh, that will be acceptable to the Congress. So you have first the technological scientific uh, side, then you have the political side, and finally you have what we might call a more generalized visionary kind of thing about sort of what kind of a society do you want to build type argument. Well, I don't, uh, we, we shouldn't denigrate that idea. It's important to have that idea, but it's very difficult to put such things into, and what it amounts to here, if I boil it down, is how do you mitigate the dangers of the flood? How do you reduce the major uh, 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 disadvantages of the flood, the, the dangers, the hazards that arise? And the simplest way is simply to move everybody out of the floodplain. That's a very simple solution. Move everybody out. This is what's happening actually in China and the Three Gorges Dam. You've heard of the Three Gorges Dam? How many have heard of the Three Gorges? Good. It's reasonably well known. This will be by far the largest dam in the world. It's under construction. They're moving a million people. Imagine trying to do that in the United States. You would have so many lawsuits that uh, I think you would never, would never succeed in such a thing. So it means that this is, th this is the simplest solution. If everybody's outside the floodplain, you have defined the floodplain, of course, you have to do that. Then if you move everybody outside of it, well, then nobody's in danger. Their property is all up on the bluff somewhere, <coughs> and so forth. But if you actually start to count how many people live in floodplains, particularly the area we're talking about, this is the flat area, the lower Missouri, the upper Mississippi, it's a relatively flat area. It's not mountainous at all. I'm going to show it to you. Many of you have seen it probably. But uh, so these are the three types of proposals that come out of a report like that. And, um, and then there are, these, as, as I held up, the additional reports. Uh, and it's a serious study, it's an important study, and it's, I think, quite well done. Uh, and it's just part of the continuing uh, attempt. And the, the real underlying issue is the one that uh, we, we try to emphasize here, namely, it's the underlying issue of how do you retain the natural environment in as, in as a, a pure a form as we can as a thing, at the same time as you have a, uh, a built infrastructure? In other words, how do you rationalize those two things? We know we have to have a built infrastructure to live as a society, but we also know that the purity of the environment is an equally important goal. And so it's balancing those things that are uh, crucial to this. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> anybody like to uh, add anything or question anything about that uh, rather overarching kind of uh, uh, comment? I mean, let me just say that this last three lectures we're going to attempt to have a kind of a more of a summary of, of the course and also of some ideas that come out of the course. So this is a first attempt at that uh, in the context of this massive flood. 
Uh, and also the flood is going to, uh, what I will comment on uh, as I show some of the slides, is uh, uh, particularly the Missouri dams that we have looked at already. What, is their, what was their role in this? And, uh, and uh, what is their role of things like that in the future? Okay, Sinead, let's have the first slide. Do much with it. Right? What? Yeah. Awesome. Can we get those out now? That's of course our. I can hit them with a stick <laughs> if necessary. We have that one. Oh, look, we got that one out. But then the room's too dark. We have to put the backlights on. Hey. Yeah, that's good. Now put the backlight on there. Okay. Can you do um, yeah, that without the touching these lights? I think the backlight puts that stupid. That's good. Okay. Oh, wonderful. That's a, that's a real breakthrough. Okay. So what we have outlined here uh, is uh, what we have been looking at. In effect, the, uh, the Ohio Basin here and the Missouri Basin here. Now, of course, the flood that we're going to talk about is really uh, in between here. It is the upper Mississippi region, so here's the upper Mississippi, and, uh, but it's also going to include uh, the Missouri River in a very strong way because once you get down into here, then the Missouri River Basin uh, is uh, crucial. So it's uh, in between and uh, going in either direction. Next slide, please. Oops, sorry. Whoops. Okay. Now I just want to remind you of the centrality of water because in the three contexts that uh, we would meet it, New York City, uh, which we haven't talked much about, municipal water supply, that could be a whole course. Uh, as many of you may know, the water supply, where does the major water supply from New York City come from? Adirondack, somebody said. Adirondack. Yeah, it's uh, essentially the Catskill Mountains. How does it get to New York City? Anybody have any idea how they get it from the Catskills? Not by people carrying buckets across with ferries. How does it get there? Aqueduct. Aqueduct. There's an underground pipe network. Uh, it's underground. There's a huge pipe under the Hudson River that carries this water into the city. So the water is very far down in pipes that are very old. And it's, uh, uh, there was a break a few years ago in Manhattan and they had to go way down to find it. You can imagine what a problem that is. Uh, we already know from the events of September what the underground part of New York can be like. Uh, and uh, anyway, <coughs> The whole idea of the water supply of the city of New York, the whole idea of any pure water supply was cholera, because that was the killer all through up to the middle of the 19th century. Well, we're familiar with the second issue, the issue of floods, and the third issue we're familiar with that as well, the dams and aqueducts. There is an aqueduct, of course, that goes across California from the Colorado River to uh, Southern California. So we have these issues of water uh, that are fundamental to life. Practically all civilization begins in a place where you have good water. Uh, <clears throat> next slide on the left. Now I ended last lecture uh, last week with this slide, which is what we want to focus on. Uh, it's a major part of our focus. It's the upper Mississippi River, which has a certain slope, although this is vastly exaggerated, of course, in, in uh, vertical scale compared to the horizontal scale. Uh, but what it's, of course, intended to show is how the river is completely structured. Completely structured in the sense that uh, it, is, it is all slack water. That is to say, uh, there is, it's essentially not a free-running river at all. Those, those represent dams. The vertical lines represent dams, not very high ones. A few of them, Keokuk Dam, which was, you, you may recall, the first power dam, the only power dam in that area, 
There's another one up here. Uh, when you get to uh, the big drop, the Falls of St. Anthony's up in Minneapolis and St. Paul. But other than that, it's entirely navigation, entirely navigation. There, there are locks and dams, and uh, so since I have done a fly over there, I'll show you what it looks like. M many of you may know already, next slide on the right. But we'll have a look. And this is the general kind of look. There are bluffs. You see the bluffs on the left there. Uh, this is actually uh, we're actually up about here uh, at La Crosse, Wisconsin, uh, and going all the way up to about here. That's all we're doing, not very much. Uh, but it shows you the typical kind of structure that we've seen, namely a dam with a, sp with a spillway, that is to say a dam like Wilson Dam that is mostly a spillway, except there's no power, and then a big lock because it is heavily used for transportation. Uh, next slide on the left. And of course an interstate highway there. Here you get a better view of the same dam as we go by it and you can see now that there are two kinds of uh, spillways in effect. And this is the big one with these big gates. I'll show a detail of that later. But uh, where the, um, uh, the, the water can actually, the, the gate can actually be such that the water just flows right straight through. There's no dam at all really. Uh, and that's a, at the time of low water, uh, when, um, uh, when you want the river to flow through. But when, the, when you want to hold back the water and use the, uh, you have to use the locks anyway, uh, then the gates are uh, closed, next slide on the right, and you have a dam. Well, here's a result of a previous flood, a bridge, incomplete, just left there, a kind of a monument to the power of the water. Uh, Next slide on the left, because when the water rises and that you have a light bridge, uh, here's a new bridge, newer bridge that is now uh, uh, has no defect. You can see all the uh, all the barges back there, so it's a major waterway, continuously in use. Next slide on the right, and the land is quite flat. Tour boat, you can see the wing of our plane. Next slide on the left, and another view. Uh, here you get a, a, a closer view of the lock, and <coughs> the slide on the right. So you could get uh, quite bored eventually, because it doesn't change. Okay, we're going one after the other, and they're all almost the same. They're not very exciting structures as a single, single one, but as a whole system, they're very important. And they have to be operated as a system. Next slide on the left. And here's a final one. Uh, <clears throat> next slide on the right. So that's the, the upper Mississippi. Now we're down at the water level and uh, you can see these huge gates. These were these drum gates. These were the largest of the type in the world. You've heard me say that about all these dams, practically, or a great many of these dams, but these were, they're very wide. Uh, they were in, the innovation came from Europe, but not the size. In the European rivers are of course Europe has no river the size of the Mississippi, and, uh, <clears throat> and so these were, these were much, much bigger uh, than they had ever used there. Next slide on the left. So you get some idea of these, and there you see the gates are up to let the water just go right straight through, so it's not a dam at all now, uh, but it will be a dam when it's needed. Next slide on the right. And here's just another view of it, in this case with the highway on top. Next slide on the left. So, you have these movable dams. So that's the, the structure of that river. So we now know something about the structure of the three basic rivers that make up the Mississippi, namely the Ohio, which is like this, the Mi upper Mississippi, which is what we've just seen, and the Missouri, which is quite <coughs> different. Quite different. There are no dams like this at all uh, on the main stem from uh, the mouth of the river up above St. Louis to Gavin's Point Dam uh, in South Dakota. And so uh, there it's just a free flowing river. And then you have complete blockage, no locks at all, uh, on the big, six big dams that we have already looked at. So now we come to the issue of the flood. National Geographic Society, they're out there with the big events <coughs> and uh, wrestling with the Mississippi. So that's the central issue, both geographically and uh, and uh, financially, next slide on the right, the Mississippi and all its tributaries, and just to remind you of the great flood of 1927. Now, 
uh, we can think of these river issues as having uh, several stages. The stage that this represents, really the end of the stage, is the levees only stage. Don't build big tributary dams, just build levees. And it was this flood which overflowed the banks in this dramatic way, as you see here, uh, that stopped that debate. And the new debate then, which arose slowly, just like the levees only debate, came, came slowly and was really beginning to be challenged in the early 20th century, uh, the next is then, okay, now we're going to build these big dams, and then gradually, after uh, 1927, gradually a debate arises over the big dams. Uh, <clears throat> next slide on the left. The major Mississippi floods. So this, uh, the, the, the uh, 1874, 1890, 1912, these are all different floods. The 1927 one on the right, the 1973 one, you recall, is the one where the Mississippi almost jumped over to the Atchafalaya, almost changed its course. And remember that since rivers naturally do change their course, if you look at a map, for example, of Holland, Netherlands, you'll see, if you look very carefully, you'll see that where the Rhine River goes now, uh, is definitely not where it used to go because in fact the Dutch have a name for the Rhine River which is somewhere else. It comes off of the Rhine, it's a small river, they call it the Laal, which is the present route of the Rhine, but the Rhine has continuously changed its location and in fact created a huge delta which is what the Netherlands is. And so the same thing is down here in Louisiana, the same sort of thing, it's a huge delta made up by various different routes that the Mississippi has taken and now wants to go down the Atchafalaya. And so that's the big problem and it was highlighted in 1973 when it almost went there. And if it had gone there, it's doubtful that they ever would have gotten it back. Uh, <clears throat> all right, now the 1993 flood is entirely different. It is not a low, uh, lower basin flood. It had not very great effect on the lower basin of the Mississippi, but a huge effect on the upper. Next slide on the right. So it's comparable. This is a uh, painting by Albert Bierstadt. Albert Bierstadt was a well-known 19th century painter of the West. He went West and he dram dramatized the West in a not always photographic accuracy, but nevertheless very dramatic. If you go in art museum, we have one of his paintings there, a very dramatic uh, painting of the West. This is a painting of the Falls. It's, it's hard to see it, but it, it's not a, not a great slide. But uh, <clears throat> the Falls of St. Anthony, how many people have been there? How many people know Minneapolis? Is this one? You know, this are okay. Not very many. All right. Well, after this course, you'll go up all the rivers and we'll see the country now, really. But in any case, at the headwaters, it's not the headwaters, the headwaters are further north, but <clears throat> the falls of St. Anthony really stopped navigation on the Mississippi River. And it is now right smack in the middle of Minneapolis. And they're still there, but they're now used as a kind of a power dam, like Niagara Falls. And uh, next slide on the left. And uh, <clears throat> this is Minneapolis. This is just the outskirts of Minneapolis. So you can see as far up as Minneapolis. This is 1969 flood. So they've been having floods regularly there, but never terribly devastating, usually localized. Usually, if you recall Professor Smith's ideas, you can have massive rainfall like they did in the Mi little Mi in the Miami River Basin, which um, uh, did, actually, that was a generalized flood in other areas too, but you can have floods in a, well, the Rapidan is the best example, that very narrow little valley which had this huge local flood. So you can have these floods locally uh, without such a big extent, but the 1993 flood was characterized by its wide extent. Uh, it was raining over a huge area, and in some sense, like the, the 1889 flood, that where the rain was over a large area of western Pennsylvania, not nearly as large as this area. Next slide on the right. Okay, now this is the map. Uh, this is actually a map of the Rock Island District of the Corps of Engineers. How many people know where Rock Island is? Oh, wonderful. <laughs> well, I've got Carl. Anyway, uh, good American geography lessons coming up. Uh, it's the what's called the Quad Cities, Rock Island and Davenport and I and Bettendorf and one other, I forget the name, maybe you remember, but there's another, there are four cities now. Uh, <coughs> Moline, Moline is the fourth. So 
In any case, I show you where they are. Uh, they're right here. And uh, this is on the Mississippi. So uh, here we are coming up the Mississippi River. Here's Keokuk. And uh, here are the four cities. And then up here is Dubuque. And then we're up across the Illinois line into Wisconsin. And then pretty soon, Minnesota and Wisconsin. So uh, it's this area uh, that was the most devastated by this 1993 flood. Here is the Des Moines River, which was particularly uh, badly hit. And uh, just over in this side here, the Missouri River, which doesn't show on this map, was also very badly hit. So this is not the map of the flood. It's the map of the Rock Island District. But it coincides with a substantial portion of the flood. It is, in fact, the, the uh, watershed of the upper Mississippi. That's what, it, that's what those dotted lines mean. Uh, next slide on the left. OK, this is the cover of the engineering news record, which is our uh, construction journal that appears every week. And you can see it's, this, the date is November 1st, 1993. Well, the flood, of course, was in July, June, July, and even into August. But the devastating thing about it was that there were substantial portions of the area still underwater in, uh, in uh, September. And uh, so it was a long-lasting flood. And that makes it very much more lethal to the landscape. Well, here you see it. There's, here's the, the Mississippi River. And uh, <coughs> uh, the idea is after the flood, mud, sweat, and fears. Next slide on the right. Obviously a paraphrase. And here are the various issues of the engineering news uh, record, which uh, they kept every week. It was very much like the World Trade Center has been. In other words, it was in the construction news, and it was in the general news too, but in the construction news continuously uh, as the thing developed, because it's a major, a major technological event. Uh, <coughs> the last, last one is a bridge that was taken out uh, across the Mississippi. Next slide on the left. Uh, no, in Des Moines. Uh, now this is the break. I, it's pretty hard to see this. This is a this is a, a, a former levee, which is now broken through at Des Moines. And uh, next slide on the right. This is uh, a, 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 so I just now point out Des Moines. Here you are, the capital of Iowa, and um, and uh, the uh, uh, this is an illustration now of what can happen in a flood. Uh, you remember, some of you may recall, that the, what happened in the, one of the things that happened in the Johnstown flood, what would be, you'd say, the most surprising thing that would happen in a flood of water? Fire. Fire, exactly. And remember, you remember the fire, the story of the fire at the bridge? And uh, so you wouldn't expect that to happen. Now here we have a flood which is all fresh water. It's a fresh water flood. And the most dangerous thing, next slide. Uh, that can happen is uh, you can't, it's hard to tell what this is, let's show the next slide and it will tell us what it is, is that uh, the water supply is destroyed. So even though you have too much water, the water supply of pure water is destroyed. And of course, very quickly, flood waters in industrialized area, if it's even partly uh, an uh, agricultural area with uh, sediment and so forth, is going to be polluted water very quickly. And this is the water treatment plant of Des Moines, which went out. So that you lose that, and in a modern, civilized, urbanized area, uh, that's a crucial aspect of life. You <coughs> lose the water treatment plant, and you lose pure water. So uh, <coughs> uh, then, of course, sediment on the farmland, uh, although that sediment is potentially very fertile land, fertile, fertile can make fertile land, uh, putting it on a farmland in a flood destroys the agriculture for at least a year and maybe longer. And of course the roads and bridges are out and that means that uh, transportation and ambulance, all those kinds of things uh, are gone. Uh, and uh, what isn't listed there is the fact that electricity can go, all the infrastructure can be destroyed uh, in one of these kinds of events. So <coughs> yeah, next slide on the left. Here you see a highway with bridges. Uh, this, these are the bridges here that have been just uh, completely <coughs> destroyed by the flood. Now, this isn't an earthquake. This is the flood that comes roaring in there. Once the levees break, comes roaring in there with a tremendous force and just takes them out. The concrete bridges that just takes them out. 
And we saw that in Rapidan, that that bridge was taken out. As we saw it sort of slowly happening, and it was essentially destroyed. Next slide on the right. So, now one of the things that we want to ask is about our big dams on the Missouri. And I showed this before, but it's appropriate to show it again. This is the 1911 map of the Missouri River, and what's important for us to locate here, if I can read it, we can read it, it's, it's right in here. This is um, Jefferson City right there, and right here is Boonville. So uh, Boonville is essentially the same place as Jefferson City. Jefferson City is a much better, much more well-known place. And uh, <clears throat> this is Jefferson City. Uh, this is a part of the infrastructure of Jefferson City. And next slide. Uh, here is the Boonville flood magnitude. Now, uh, you see that um, the introduction of the big dams, well, Fort Peck comes about here, uh, then Garrison comes in about here, and then finally Gavin's Point is somewhere in here, and you can't tell it from this diagram. And here's the 1993 flood. So uh, what is happening, of course, is that there are so many tributaries below uh, South Dakota, so we, you can see them here. Uh, these, the Platte River, uh, the Republican River. Uh, they should name this the Democrat River, I suppose, but they haven't done that yet. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> so these are all coming in before you get to the city, and they're bringing a good deal of water, and particularly in this kind of a flood, when there's so much rainfall in that area. And remember, the, the, the dams themselves, those dams are starting at the border of South Dakota, and that uh, going up there is rather dry. Anyway, always much drier than the other areas. So that uh, <coughs> the dams uh, seem to have no effect here. On the other hand, you can make a calculation of what would have happened, and that's what the Corps did. You can make a calculation of what would have happened without the dams. In other words, what was the flow in the river then, and it certainly was still substantial at Gavin's Point, at the lowest dam, and that would have been uncontrolled, and that would have simply added to all of this. So even though it wouldn't have, uh, it wouldn't have uh, uh, prevented the flood, uh, once again, the, the the assumption is that it would have made the flood much worse. Next slide, please. Well, this is the water treatment plant of Jefferson City. Underwater. And underwater, remember, I said, for a long time. In other words, the flood lasted for a long time. It lasted for a long time because the ground was so soaked that there was no way the water could seep in. It had to gradually flow out from the levees, and of course it gets behind the levees, it's very complicated, and um, uh, <coughs> the, uh, so it, it, it may, it's a very dangerous, very dangerous, potentially very dangerous situation. Next slide on the left. And here's Jefferson City now, seen as the city itself, it looks like, almost like a seacoast city, here's the river over here, here's the capital, it's the capital of Missouri, and the interstate, which has stayed above the water level, but the water is all over the town, uh, so that uh, pretty devastating effect on the town. Next slide on the right. And this is just a way of showing, this is sediment actually, but it, it starts, it's hard to read it up here, here's Gavin's Point, and you can see that Gavin's Point uh, completely stops the sediment below it, and then gradually the tributaries and the river itself will bring more sediment in, and we can read this also as a kind of a uh, uh, as a kind of a diagram of how much water is going to come in as well, in other words, in a flood, so that Gavin's Point has the potential to stop it, uh, and uh, with the other dams together they could stop the flow from above, from the upper river, <coughs> but they can't do anything about the tributaries, and so that's all that is intended to show, you've seen that before. Uh, next slide. Okay, and this is now uh, in the in the Quad Cities, this next slide on the right. This is uh, I'm going back to this map, this again. So now we're back to Davenport. Now Davenport's a very interesting city. Very independent people um, live in Davenport because they were warned. The Corps of Engineers said, "Look, you don't have any protection. You don't have a levee." 
And the Davenport says, we don't want a levy, it's ugly. It's going to destroy our waterfront. So they didn't have a levy. So then they got, of course, well, here you see what they got, uh, bad flooding. And um, so there was quite a conflict, as you can imagine. People saying, well, we warned you. They saying, well, it's still your responsibility to, you're in charge of the rivers, you have to build them back for us or something. So it's the kind of conflict that you can get into, that you do get into continuously on these issues. Next slide on the left. And this is, um, <coughs> this is Rock Island, the other one of the, this are, it's in Illinois, Davenport's in Iowa, and this is, shows you very clearly a broken levee. Now the problem with the levees was, we know already the generalized problem, but the specific problem was that there was no control, as the Davenport example gives you. The federal government has really no control over the building of levees in the sense that if a city demands there be no levy, well, they got away with it. And in many cases, uh, the areas, uh, the many cases, the, the, the levees are privately built. This one, I'm sure, was privately built. It just doesn't look to me like, I don't know for sure, but it doesn't look to me like a federal levy, big, wide federal levy. A lot of them were privately built and were, uh, were continuously maintained locally and survived for a long time, but then eventually got overwhelmed, as they did in this, in this uh, case. Next slide. So I just remind you, I've shown you this before, the building up of levees and private, if it's in a relatively wealthy community area, they can afford to build a levee. It's not that expensive. It's not like building a big concrete dam. Uh, and particularly if, they, if it hasn't been broken too badly, they can continuously build it up, just dumping dirt. But on the other hand, it isn't a very, uh, one of the conclusions of this report is that there should be a federally mandated design for any levees. Uh, not too easy to do, but, uh, but that was one of the proposals. Next slide. Well, uh, here is uh, the Bazura River, and I want to just end with looking at that once again <laughs> since it's one we're familiar with. This is the, the whole plan, where the dams are shown up here, here's Gavin's Point down here, and then from here on, the part of the Pixloan plan, next slide on the right, it's, we're talking now about the Pixloan plan, and part of the plan was to build, federally, to build these levees. Well, a lot of them didn't get built. The dams, as we know, did get built, but not all the levees did get built. Uh, it's much harder because they're so mixed up with local control. And uh, uh, so they were, they were quite, um, um, in, in many cases, they were overwhelmed by this flood because it was the lower Missouri that was hit the hardest, clearly. Next slide on the left. And an image of that, this I think I showed before too, this is the, a satellite image, Landsat image, of 1988 at the junction of the Mississippi and Missouri River. This is the Missouri up here coming in. And uh, next slide on the right. Then this is 1993, the flood. So you can see the black obviously is the flooded area and it shows the tremendous difference and what happened at the mouth essentially of the Missouri when you get down there where it's dumping into the Mississippi. On the other hand, once it gets into the Mississippi, with that huge influx from the Ohio River, uh, and the, 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 it's, it was more or less lost. Not completely, of course, because it did hit Davenport and so forth up above, but the, down below, there's so much water that the added amount from the flood didn't make a huge difference. Next slide on the left. Uh, so we reminded of all that, that in effect, uh, the whatever gets dumped in here and here is not such a great percentage of this whole thing as to make a major flood. You remember that the 1927 flood, the rainfall was down here. It was down there in that wonderful story of Barry's uh, in uh, Mississippi where the rain just keep came, coming and coming and coming. There was flooding from above too, but it was mostly this continual rain in the lower basin. Next slide on the right. Well, this is Gavin's Point Dam, just to remind us of the end of that pick Sloan, major pick Sloan result. And uh, so the report is claiming a very substantial <coughs> benefit from those dams for flood control, but not a benefit in the sense of prevention, just a benefit in the sense of mitigation. Next slide on the left. And um, uh, so just to remind you, and next slide on the right of that big uh, system. And I show this 
at the end because this goes up to 1937 and this if we redrew this now and carried it to 1993 then this ball up here would be bigger than this one so just to give you an idea in other words what this tells you is of course the difficulty of predictions I mean when you look at this and say look that's a record of 35 years and uh, uh, so this should be an indication of what's going to happen well of course the 1948 flood on the Columbia isn't even there uh, so uh, uh, you see there's nothing up in that corner so it does mean that we're involved in this in this very difficult procedure uh, of thinking about how to not necessarily prevent the flood we're not going to be able to prevent the rainfall but how we can best organize technologically, uh, politically, and in the sense of uh, the vision of how you deal with a floodplain and the whole basin. How can we do that so that these, uh, these damaging events, or these, these major events, become less damaging? Okay, see you next week. <laughs>